A very warm welcome to today's seminar here at SNS. Uh, my name is Mia Huna Bransian and I am the CEO of SNS. And it is a very great honor to welcome Professor Raghuram Rajan to SNS, uh, who will talk to us on the challenges facing the world economy. Let me also welcome Klaus Eklund, known to us all, senior economist at the SEB, who will guide us through this morning and uh, who will be our moderator. So you will also give a short presentation of Professor Rajan. So I leave the floor to you. Most welcome. Thank you, Mia. Well, as you heard, I am supposed to be your moderator today. Uh, and uh, our speaker, I assume most of you already know quite a lot about. There's some room up here if you want to. Um, he was until recently the um, governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And uh, before that, you know, he was chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. And as such, he became world famous when he, pre before the financial crisis, criticized the... Um, let's call it irrational exuberance of the exotic subprime market and all the risks that were hidden at that time, but we, some of which he saw. And if I remember correctly, you were in sort of a verbal fight with Larry Summers about this, and he said, Rajan is much too pessimistic, but Rajan was proven right and Summers wrong. During the, um, or right after the crisis, he also wrote a book about the experience and not least about the inequality and the, the shift in the income and um, wealth distribution, which, according to Professor Rajan, led to stabilization risks, something which also has been proven correct. The name of the book, which is very readable, is Fault Lines, How Hidden Fractures Still Threatens the World Economy. And it was um, awarded the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Prize for Best Business Book of the Year in 2010. Uh, he is also, now he's back in Chicago where he once studied um, as a professor, as you can see. Um, but he, while during his stint as governor of the Central Bank of India, he was uh, by the Time magazine named one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And it's not that often that we have one of the 100 most influential people in the world at this rostrum. So we are deeply honored to have you here, sir. Now, the setup of the meeting is quite simple. Professor Rajan will speak for about 40, 45 minutes about the global economy. And let me stress, he will not talk about India because, of course, he cannot and should not grade his successor at the Royal Bank and other places. Uh, but he will talk about the global economy. And after that, we'll have a discussion and Q&A. There will be a microphone, and you have to speak in the microphone because otherwise you will not be caught on tape and you will not be visible to the millions of people who will be watching YouTube and seeing this seminar in retrospect. Now, please, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me here. And... Uh, Ambassador, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, what I want to talk about today, uh, I understand uh, our hosts today uh, are largely focused on economics, but occasionally do politics, uh, etc. Today I want to reverse that and largely focus on politics and then the implication for economics, because I think the political environment today is, is going to drive what happens economically. Uh, and of course, the the single biggest change in in recent months has been uh, what one might call the populist insurrections uh, across the industrial world. Uh, the first uh, uh, sign of that was was Brexit. Uh, then we have the U.S. elections. Um, people find it hard to classify the Italian uh, uh, referendum. But going forward, we have elections in uh, France uh, and other countries. Um, I think uh, one should not underestimate the effect that these pop populist movements 
have on the broader economy and, uh, and broader structures. Uh, and these certainly have the possibility, not just because I believe they be based on deep economic forces that have been playing out over the last, last couple of decades, but those forces are probably going to get worse. And as a result, uh, it, it's premature to assume these are passing fads which will go away once these movements are found to not produce the goods that they promise. In fact, I believe uh, unless we change the structure of, uh, of our economies and society, uh, we probably will risk uh, a significantly greater turmoil. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, uh, talk about what it implies for economic policy in the short term, as well as some issues over the long term. Uh, I have 40, 45 minutes, so I don't want to spend too much time uh, lecturing from the podium. I'd rather uh, spend time answering questions. But if we get there, I do want to talk about uh, the novelization of monetary policy as, uh, as reflation gains strength. Uh, we could talk about Chinese, uh, 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 the Chinese economy and the issues with Chinese non-sovereign debt. Uh, I think these are potential uh, sources of risk going forward. And of course, a third topic on which you're probably better informed than I am is banking in Europe, especially starting with Italian banking. Um, I do want to uh, talk about longer term uh, risks, but I don't want to end at, at just being uh, pessimistic. I think there are also reasons for optimism, and I want to flag some of that uh, before I end. So um, let me start first with why the populist insurrections and why they've come to a, a, a boil just now. And I would argue that the underlying factors have been uh, playing out for quite some time, even before the global financial crisis. And I'll, I'd single out two important ones. Uh, one is that populations in industrial countries are aging. And aging populations do have effects on growth, uh, partly because uh, on the production side, uh, there are fewer workers. Uh, and as a result, the workforce uh, at some point starts growing at a less fast rate, eventually stabilizes, and then starts shrinking as it has been in Japan. But even in the United States, which is a fairly young economy because of immigration, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, in a study suggests that uh, growth today is about a one and a quarter percentage points less uh, because of, uh, of population aging uh, than, f for example, in 1980. So that's, that's a subtraction in, uh, in potential growth because there, is, uh, uh, there are fewer people joining the workforce. Uh, this is in contrast to the earlier periods when the baby boomers were joining the workforce and therefore adding substantially uh, to the workforce and enhancing growth. But the second, uh, there, there are other ways in which they affect uh, growth, uh, and it could be from the demand side, uh, that as uh, impending retirement nears, you, you start saving more. Uh, at the two ages, very young children, very old people, consume more, but in between uh, you may save more and you could have greater savings uh, as people anticipate retirement, subtracting from demand. Now, um, the effects of aging are complicated. We're trying to understand them. Even now in Japan, for example, uh, after so many years of a fall, a, a steady fall in the labor force, we still don't know how to measure recessions in Japan. Uh, as the labor force is shrinking, perhaps we should renormalize recessions to not 0% growth, but maybe negative 1, negative 2% growth indicates a recession because the norm is that because you have shrinking workforce, you will actually have well, that, that horrible word, degrowth, uh, or a fall in growth uh, simply because labor force is falling. Anyway, even just from simple things like measurement, there are lots of things we have to learn about how to deal with population aging, uh, but it certainly is uh, one explanation for why we have slower growth. But we also have slower productivity growth, and productivity is something we understand even less than aging. Um, 
um, aging, at least we know how it's going. We don't know the consequences of productivity. We don't even know when it appears and when it doesn't appear. Uh, what we had in 1995 to 2005 was very strong productive, labor productivity growth. Uh, in the U.S., it was about 2.9% a year. And then suddenly it fell off a cliff. Uh, from 2005 onwards, it's about 1.3%. Now, uh, that's a huge difference. Uh, and uh, we don't understand why, in fact, it fell off when all you hear in the papers is a tremendous amount of talk about driverless cars, new energy sources, renewable energy of this kind and that kind, new batteries, all suggest there should be a lot more productivity, but it's not seen in numbers. We, I don't want to get into the discussion about why we don't see it, what's going on, but it's, it seems to be that there is some, uh, it, it is for real, that this is not something just because of mismeasurement or undercounting. It appears across a number of countries. It's not just the U.S. It appears across a number of countries. And it has happened before. In the 30s, what you saw was as this wonderful new innovation, electricity, was rolled out across uh, the United States, uh, suddenly for 10 years there was very low productivity growth. We don't understand why that happened, but then it resumed in the 40s. So it is possible that this wonderful new in in innovation of information technology as it gets rolled out, there are periods when you have... Uh, you don't see the effects in terms of productivity, but then it comes back. That's a source of hope, but it's only a source of hope because we don't know for sure whether it will come back, whether we're not uh, understanding how it doesn't play out. Now, even while growth hasn't been that strong, and in fact potential growth may have fallen in industrial countries, uh, the distribution of that growth has also been very problematic. And this is where uh, both trade and technology, uh, while helping to enhance output, uh, have probably hit the middle class significantly. And, and you've heard this in so many ways, so I don't want to dwell too much on it. Uh, but essentially, routine, unskilled jobs have been automated or outsourced, and it's reflected, uh, certainly in the United States, in a stagnant median wage. And I do know Sweden is, uh, is somewhat different, but uh, in a number of countries, there's been tremendous pressure from both trade and technology on uh, so-called good manufacturing jobs. Uh, in the U.S., about 5 million manufacturing jobs have been lost in the first decade of this century, um, and it, the losses continue. Interestingly, uh, the real value added in manufacturing has remained constant as a fraction of GDP in the U.S. for the last 40 or 50 years. That's suggesting that what is happening in manufacturing is not really that the U.S. is losing market share because you know, the jobs are necessarily disappearing elsewhere. Yes, the U.S. is moving across industries. You don't do so much coal mining in the U.S., but you do a lot more IT uh, production in the U.S. Uh, it is moving across industries, but its share of manufacturing has not really changed. What has happened is it's doing it much more productively especially in the IT sector, and as a result, the number of jobs in manufacturing have fallen. Now, I've argued in, a, in, a, in the book that Klaus uh, mentioned that uh, in response to the angst that this creates, especially uh, in, in one, one industry, one firm towns, uh, in, uh, in rural areas, um, as these, uh, these manufacturing jobs, which are a source of, uh, of uh, stable employment, uh, start disappearing, and as uh, people get more anxious, um, um, something has to be done. Something needed to be done, uh, uh, particularly if uh, you look at the study that uh, Angus Deaton did uh, last year, which is a very worrisome study where he shows that uh, over the period 1999 to 2013, you've had approximately 500,000 more deaths amongst white males in the, uh, in the employable age uh, than would be assumed if their health parameters increased at the same rate as other ethnic groups. So white males have been dying out. Uh, 500,000 over this period, remember the Vietnam War was approximately the same period, there were 50,000 deaths. So one way of saying it is it's 10 Vietnam Wars at the same time. What are they dying of? They're dying of 
alcohol overdose, uh, 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 drug overdose, alcohol, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, essentially all sorts of ailments associated, and suicide, all sorts of ailments associated with worry, poor health, resembles eerily what was happening to Russian males after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And, and, and I think what this suggests is great anxiety. And of course, in response to great anxiety, politicians response, uh, respond. And I, I have argued elsewhere that some of the pressure on um, allowing more financialization, uh, the increase in house prices, construction jobs, etc., was to deal with this problem. And in fact, construction jobs replaced manufacturing jobs in many of the places where there were job losses, manufacturing job losses, except that that solution was untenable uh, as the subprime mortgage crisis hit the United States. Uh, but I would argue similar solutions were in place, for example, in Spain or in Greece. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, post-financial crisis, that solution stopped working. Not only did it stop working, but you had a whole load of debt on top to deal with, uh, which you didn't have before. But this equilibrium, uh, pre-financial crisis, was extremely good for the emerging markets because they could uh, produce for domestic de for demand elsewhere. Uh, I think one of the um, the canonical uh, sort of uh, truths uh, as a policymaker is domestic demand is much harder to handle than foreign demand. It's much easier to export for growth than to create your own growth. Because invariably, as you create your own growth, you run into bubbles, uh, credit excesses, et cetera, et cetera, uh, fiscal deficits, current account deficits, all of which are problematic. But if you're exporting for growth, all that goes away. Well, emerging markets had a really good time over this period. All that came to an end with the global financial crisis. But I haven't still got to why the global financial crisis? So there was this underlying force beforehand of pressure on the middle class in a number of countries. But what the global financial crisis did was three things which exacerbated this pressure. First, of course, the obvious one, job losses amongst the same group that had lost jobs earlier, but this time with additional debt loads because their houses were now deeply underwater. Uh, but a second factor, which was... Uh, important was that even the people who had jobs became much more uncertain about the future, especially because their entitlements now were much more shaky. Given that governments had taken on so much debt and given the size of the entitlements looked so enormous going forward, and this is why uh, great concern, uh, for example, in the United States, about expanding entitlements to new uh, uh, sections such as minorities, the Obamacare, is very much opposed by uh, sections of the white middle class because they feel that it's targeted at a whole new set of people and will in fact vitiate the health of their own entitlements. It'll come at our expenses. We're going to pay for them and we're not going to have enough for ourselves. So uh, uh, the, the um, you know, the standard statement uh, that's often, uh, take, take your government hands off my social security, right? Uh, I mean, social security is a government program. Uh, but the sense amongst these people is we paid for it. In fact, nobody has really paid for it because it's a pay-as-you-go system. But we paid for it. It's our entitlement. It's our property right. And by extending more insurance to the minorities, to the, uh, to the excluded, you're basically diluting uh, our entitlements. So, so first, loss of construction jobs. Second, uh, uh, worries about future entitlements. But the third, which I think is the most important, is uh, a total discrediting of the elite. So who are the elite? These are the smart guys in this room, the smart guys in Washington. Uh, basically, anybody with an education, uh, with a professional uh, uh, qualification and working in the professions. And um, these are the guys who couldn't keep us out of the financial crisis. They didn't know enough, you know, uh, echoing what the Queen of England asked people at the LSE. Why didn't nobody, why did nobody predict it? Uh, but more important, uh, when it came, they couldn't take us out. So they don't know. Uh, we've had eight years of slow growth. They haven't been able to take us out. 
But most important of all, biased. They're okay. They're doing okay. We're the guys who are suffering. We're the guys whose plants are closing down. We're the guys who are still losing jobs. Uh, and they bailed out the bankers. Not one banker went to jail. They look after their own kind. These are the guys who congregate at Davos, you know, have uh, sip, sip fine wine in the, in, in, the cold, uh, uh, in the cold temperature there, uh, talk to each other, and further their country's systems to accommodate immigrants, to accommodate minorities, etc. They have this multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic view of the world, uh, open borders. It's all good for them not good for us. I think that's, that, that sort of framing of, uh, of policy is very important because uh, these are people who do believe in markets. So when they lose jobs, you know, markets working, we need to figure out how to deal with it. But when they think the system is biased, that it favors the unfair uh, competitor from abroad, they don't believe they're losing jobs because the market's working. They're lo losing jobs because the system's against them. And as a result, now they want to change the system. And this is where the movement gains strength. Uh, let's talk about changing the system because the system's not working for us. Yes, we work hard every day. Yes, we don't want handouts. We don't want, but we want a fair deal. We're not getting a fair deal. And this is where the language of the populists start making sense. I'm going to promise you a fair deal. Now, uh, uh, the, the problem, of course, is that if you talk to the economists, uh, there's no way you're going to bring back coal mining jobs in, in West Virginia. There is no way that somebody who's lost his job as an auto worker at age 50 will find anything without retraining in a massive way and will probably suffer a loss in earnings because he's moving industry at an older age uh, with less capabilities than somebody who's starting out young. Okay? But they don't want to hear that from people. They don't want to hear uh, uh, Hillary Clinton saying, we're going to give you the means to retrain yourself because they find retraining is something all those elite people talk about it's hard, uh, and we've never experienced enough support from that. And I do know Sweden has a very different system. We talked about it this yesterday evening. But in the U.S., there's not enough of a support system to make this happen. So they get anxious that you're talking about a cure which I don't believe will work. And when the populace goes to them and says, I'm going to get your jobs back, maybe they don't believe the populist 100%, but at least... He's talking the language that they want to hear. I'm going to change the system. I'm not going to keep this open liberal market order, which has been unfair to me. I'm going to change the system so it's fairer to you. Right? So um, there is an appeal there to these people. There's also a hankering back. There's a talk about a community. A communi community of hardworking, like-minded people who look after each other and so on. Uh, there are race elements, ethnic elements in that kind of language. But it is, a, 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 it is something that, uh, that appeals uh, when uh, workers in a, in a community which has now been, uh, um, uh, in a sense, destroyed by change. Because the young have left to the cities uh, because there's all the workers in the cities. Uh, the one factory in town has closed. Uh, there are a few desultory shops. The community is broken. And they like the talk of going back to the old community, uh, which, uh, again, is something that, uh, that these populists emphasize. So I, I think there are similarities across countries. For example, in France, you have a similar kind of language. Uh, I think in the FT today, there was an article about this book, which talks about Paris, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of elite in Paris, ignoring the countryside, which is again being depopulated by, uh, uh, by, by uh, the talented and, and the good people, uh, leaving uh, a devastated community there. 
So what 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 implications does this have for policy? Well, well, certainly uh, uh, there is an attempt to try and replace the jobs that were lost, and for relatively unskilled people, uh, almost surely the first thing that politicians think of is construction, uh, because that's a sure way of getting jobs. Of course, construction and infrastructure takes longer to plan. Uh, it's all very well to say we need more infrastructure, but to plan it in a proper way takes more time. So um, uh, certainly in the United States, uh, uh, Donald Trump is uh, a builder, and uh, there is some uh, sense that, uh, that he may focus on infrastructure, but those plans at this point are not very concrete. Uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's one emphasis we, we might see. Um, there's a big uh, emphasis on what is called the bonfire of regulations. So uh, populists are very much for the small and medium enterprises. These are the hardworking people who go to work every day. Uh, we need to make it easier for them to uh, do their business, which means get rid of all these regulations which have accumulated over time. In the United States, there's a feeling that during the Obama administration, but even during the Bush administration, there has been an accumulation of uh, regulation, uh, certainly on things like energy, on clean air, etc., uh, but also in the financial sector because of the post-global financial crisis regulation. So one of the things that is proposed is to eliminate uh, a variety of regulations. Short run could be positive for growth, Longer run, of course, it has consequences on financial stability, on climate change, etc., which could have negative effects. But again, uh, the populists are much more focused on the short run because their constituency is bleeding and they need to deal with that. Similarly, trade. Um, you know, trade uh, has uh, had significant effects on manufacturing jobs. Probably technology has had more effects but what is visible is trade because you can't fight technology. So there will be some uh, elements of protectionism in trade. Uh, I think uh, the hopeful look at uh, Mr. Trump and see somebody who has negotiating ploys rather than firm beliefs. And uh, they hope that the 35% threat tariffs and the 45% tariffs that he's promised for Mexico and China will actually be starting points of a negotiation on opening up uh, in, in China's case, opening up China to imports. Uh, but that's the optimistic view. Uh, a more pessimistic view is as the U.S. reflates with some of this infrastructure spending, with some of the tax cuts that are going to increase the deficit, the trade deficit will also increase, which will put more pressure for anti-trade uh, actions. So uh, one of the things we are going to see is a much more emphasis on growth, in the short run, uh, much less of a concern towards institutions. Institutions are long-term stuff. And therefore, if you, you know, attack the institutions, not that big a deal, certainly for the short run. Uh, one example of an institution, a very elite institution, is the central bank. Central bankers talk amongst each other in language nobody else understands. Uh, they're highly educated. Um, uh, they are a classic example of the global elite. Uh, and as a result, they have to be brought, uh, brought back, to, back to earth. Uh, and uh, it's not surprising that you see a number of populist governments attacking their central banks and, and saying they have to get, it, get together with a program. Now, what that means is less clear. Uh, what that means is less clear. Certainly the attacks on the Fed... Uh, while um, um, we had a democratic administration, were more along the lines of you have to raise interest rates more quickly. Uh, whether that will change once we have uh, a, a new administration is not clear, but what is certainly true is tremendous political pressure on the central banks uh, and, and arguments that they're deviating from being with the people. Uh, what is also likely to happen is a much more cavalier atti attitude towards debt, right? Uh, you hear echoes again of, uh, I think, Dick Cheney's statement, Ronald Reagan proved that deficits don't matter. Uh, it's not clear that uh, he proved anything of that sort, uh, but with uh, substantial emphasis on cutting taxes and increasing spending, uh, the consequences for U.S. deficits is going to be uh, 
larger deficits. We already see the UK uh, running larger deficits. Uh, it's off a uh, 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 it, it's similar uh, because the emphasis is on the short term and not about the long term. I think the the most worrisome aspect for the medium run, m- much of this um, could be sort of justified in, in some uh, ways. Um, if you um, remember in the 30s, uh, with the benefit of hindsight and history, we say one of the beneficial things was to depart from the gold standard then because that then allowed a reflation of the economy then. Um, Paul Krugman has been thumping the table for some time, uh, certainly in the case of Japan, but more broadly, that to get away from deflationary situations, we need central banks who are credibly responsible. Uh, so that they don't tighten at the first sign of inflation, that then allows for inflation expectations to build up over or, or, uh, over time. It is possible if you argued in that fashion that uh, some uh, uh, sort of uh, pressure on the central banks, moving them away from their inflation mandate, may be in fact good. Of course, what is unclear is which way they wa- the, the populists are trying to move them. Uh, but if, in fact, you move them towards a more reflationary uh, sense, made them a little more tolerant of inflation, maybe we'd put some distance today from the, uh, from the current uh, disinflationary conditions. At least that's an argument that is plausible, even if you don't believe in its correctness. I'm a little skeptical about it, but, but that's an argument that could be made. What cannot be made is uh, the attitude towards international agreement. Uh, which which I think is very problematic because the international problems are already upon us, uh, problems like climate change, etc. And uh, I think the uh, the focus in, internally, um, to the exclusion of, of the outside, essentially means we don't worry about the world, and that means backing off from international agreement, which I think is going to create a setback to our ability to deal with these these problems going forward. So so short run, I think uh, there could be positive effects, uh, inflation expectations um, on employment, on growth, um, though with the U.S. pretty close to full employment, with uh, the need for people with more skills uh, and uh, uh, the non-participants in labor force don't seem to have those skills, there may be upward pressure on prices and therefore a more rapid adjustment of interest rates may actually happen if the Trump administration rules out its plans of tax tax cuts as well as infrastructure spending. Uh, what this will do, however, for the rest of the world is probably positive. Uh, the dollar appreciation uh, eases monetary conditions in other countries and reduces the need for them to be significantly more aggressive in their monetary policies, finding new and exotic ways of, uh, of uh, accommodation. Uh, so one quick uh, and early example of this is the effective tapering announced by the e- ECB. Of course, nobody from the ECB will say this is tapering, but this is effectively what has happened. I think the fact that the dollar is appreciated and the fact that the U.S. seems to be in reflationary mode has actually given the ECB room. Certainly, the Bank of Japan also has room with the, with the yen depreciating. Uh, So growth, inflation, uh, uh, um, and the dollar are all probably going to go up somewhat, uh, all of which is uh, is somewhat positive for the industrial world in the short run. Uh, Medium term, there are lots of questions, uh, as one might imagine. Uh, And uh, in an integrated world, the the sort of inward-lookingness of the new policies is undoubtedly going to cause more frictions going forward. Uh, The uh, most likely hit in this are going to be the emerging markets. On the one hand, they benefit from the stronger growth. On the other hand, if this translates into larger deficits, which then create political pressure on the emerging markets, uh, including China, it is going to be problematic. Uh, One of the biggest concerns in emerging markets right now, of course, is not only the stronger dollar, because they have a lot of dollar debt, but also the 
capital flows turning the other way, going back into the industrial countries, away from the emerging markets. And as we know, time and again, this is when you have uh, fragility in the emerging markets and the potential for crisis. There are danger points across the world. Uh, all you have to ask is who's running a large current account deficit. And with the normalization of oil prices, I don't know how long it will last, but if it does last, who's also a large commodity importer uh, who has not set their house in order during these times, I think you will see those are leading candidates for problems going forward. Uh, what is also important to note is emerging markets have the same kind of problems with technology as industrial countries. Uh, China, for example, is finding that manufacturing jobs are also falling in China because, again, there's a lot more automation that's going on. And the problem that emerging markets have is dealing with these problems of technology uh, without the kind of safety net, without the kind of wealth that industrial countries have. And so I would argue that given that all countries have the same problem, all countries are trying to deal with it, um, uh, if they all try and deal it with it the same way by trying to increase their exports and reduce their imports, nobody's going to succeed. Uh, and that is why uh, what worries me most about this period is what happens on the international front because we have a number of large countries, all of whom are fairly independent in their thinking, all of whom are trying to gain advantage against each other and don't find they have domestic flexibility because their constituencies are very angry. And that is a problem. Uh, um, let me talk a little bit about China before I, uh, I, I, I close, because I want to emphasize that China is also undergoing a huge change at this time. Uh, and, uh, and, and given that geopolitically we are in a period where we have one uh, global economic power now being challenged by another global economic power, but both global powers have domestic problems. Uh, it is a very um, sensitive situation at the global level uh, because their external actions may be driven by their internal problems, uh, and uh, uh, that, that is not a good recipe for Entente. Um, what is happening in China, of course, is this... Uh, is the, these shifts in the growth model uh, from investment to consumption-led, from exports to domestic demand, from industry to services, and from a government-directed growth structure to market-led. This is the intent. Okay? And if it went this way, it would reduce the kinds of political problems that China's growth has caused uh, in the, in the global economy, uh, as, as other countries have tried to accommodate or, or have had to accommodate China's growth. In, attempt, in an attempt to achieve this, China has been embarked on a process of steady and, and fairly pragmatic reform. The problem, however, is that um, China also has an aging population, which is very much dependent on that son who is supporting uh, um, you know, uh, two parents and four grandparents, uh, or that daughter who is supporting an equal number of, uh, of uh, parents and grandparents, um, having a job. Uh, slow growth is unacceptable because the social security net has been whittled away, that, that uh, iron bowl in, in China, cradle to grave, the government took care of you, has, has disappeared. Uh, along with the jobs that gave you that kind of protection. Uh, and so people are left with, without the children who used to look after them, now they have only one child because of the one-child policy, uh, but also without the savings uh, because Chinese uh, um, um, compensation rates for saving have been very limited. And so you can understand that slowing growth creates tremendous anxiety because will my child have a job, but also creates anxiety because where are the rates of return uh, in a slowing economy? What are the new areas where I'm going to get returns? So what we have in China is a stop-go process of economic growth. Uh, 
we slow down uh, as we try and move towards this new model of growth, emphasizing consumption, emphasizing uh, domestic demand. And then we say, look, we can't slow down so much because jobs aren't being created, because the returns aren't there for investors. So again, you prime the pump of credit growth from the government-led uh, banks into state-owned enterprises that build out new stuff, new infrastructure. You create growth for a little while, and everything starts booming once again, and a whole load of money starts chasing returns once again in China, from bubble to bubble. And um, so for a while, you go into that mode, and then you find things are getting very peaky. House prices are just booming, and you worry about creating a new bubble in housing markets. So again, you clamp down and you go back to slower growth until the slower growth becomes a problem. And again, you all this is government-led. So you're not able to get away from letting the market lead this process because the political forces prevent you from a hands-off policy. Uh, you know, you can overlay on this this. Uh, the role of the Communist Party, as well as the fight against corruption and the need for stability and the need. You can get into a lot of complications here. But the basic underlying economic problem is you need to transit to a new model, but you can't slow down too much. And therefore, every time you slow down, you ramp up growth. And each time you ramp up, you're increasing debt in the system. And eventually that debt may get too much. It's already increased quite a bit in the last few years as a result of this ramping up. So China has its own problems. China needs growth. That growth will still come from exports and investment for some time. And that will create tensions between China and the industrial world. And so that, to my mind, is going to be one of the biggest issues that needs to be dealt with in the years to come. How does the industrial world's concern with its manufacturing job losses uh, square with China's concern about, yes, the need to move to a new system, but to keep the old system going while that's still providing the jobs that its people need? So this, to my mind, is something that is of importance, great importance. Um, let me end with... Uh, uh, with uh, you know, both the pessimism and the optimism. The uh, pessimism, of course, is that we're in a worse position now than before the global financial crisis uh, because uh, of, uh, of all the debt that has built up. Uh, we've had over the last one and a half decades or two decades a process of musical crisis. Uh, you know, the, um, you get... Uh, um, debt being pumped up in industrial countries until it can get pumped up no more, at which point the emerging markets pump up debt until they can pump it up no more, and it goes back to the industrial countries. That's not a good recipe for st stability. Eventually, it comes to an end, and I think we're pretty much at that point. Um, we have enormous promises made to aging populations in industrial countries. How do we deal with them? Uh, the ideal way would be to grow into those promises, because after all those promises, many of them were made in periods of strong growth. But if growth is not coming, uh, are we going to default on them? Uh, are we going to inflate away some of them, especially those that aren't real promises? Or are we going to negotiate them? And how do we negotiate them when those who have been promised these things are extremely angry? Uh, it's it's going to be a, a an important tension. But I think most important concern is do we go back on integration? Do we go back on markets? Do we go back on technology? Uh, my sense is the solution to many of our problems lies in, in preserving those things, in preserving markets, in preserving integration. Um, but in this period of popular anger, uh, how do we protect those, those, those aspects? Uh, forget moving forward, how we just protect what we already have in terms of markets, in terms of integration. And I think that's going to be the uh, the concern that we have over the next, next, next few years. Because I think that if we allow these things to play out, uh, technology has solutions for many of our problems. 
uh, the global market has solutions for many of the problems of low demand f- from aging, a- aging societies. Uh, some amount of immigration, appropriately controlled and absorbed, has uh, to be part of a solution, again, for aging economies. So if we can bring all this together, there's no doubt we can solve the problems that are confronting us. Uh, the danger, as in the 30s, is that we don't keep it together. Uh, and we succumb to some of the isms. Now, l- let me let me uh, end finally by, by saying uh, sometimes we draw too hasty a parallel between the 30s and now. Uh, what was going on in the 30s has some similarity. Uh, uh, some uh, slowing growth in some sectors, uh, uh, significant job losses, technological unemployment in some sectors, uh, uh, certainly some concerns uh, amongst the population similar to what we have uh, today. Uh, but in the 30s, the isms that were important, communism and fascism, uh, were much more about a sort of imperial view of the world, about, you know, Mussolini and Hitler were about creating, uh, recreating the empires that were blocked by the First World War, uh, and communism was about taking over the world for communism. Uh, the Populist movements today are not about imperial conquest. They're actually more isolationist. Not necessary that that is significantly better. I I think it's better, but not significantly, because as you pull back in an integrated world, you leave spaces. And who's going to fill those spaces and how are those spaces filled? Especially in a world where you have competition for leadership. Uh, That space filling itself, that change, may create new tensions that one has to worry about. So I would say we're not in this exactly the same situation. Some of the pressures are similar, response to technology, response to trade. Uh, what happened in the 30s was a shutdown of trade, which hurt us for 40 years after that. Uh, but I don't expect the same things to happen, but I do think there's a cause for worry. Let me stop there. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for this uh, stimulating and provocative expose over challenges in the world economy. Can I take the liberty of starting to ask one question or one comment about China before going back to the advanced economies? Um, You described this sort of stop-go policy. Another way of sort of describing this is that China is actually uh, deregulating. They are gradually deregulating capital controls. Uh, They are... Uh, also deregulating interest rates, which means that they are going to, well, they are coming into the sort of trilemma problem that the West has had. It is impossible to control the currency in domestic uh, rates and and the current, um, the capital flows at the same time. Uh, But when they do deregulate, of course, then what happens is what you described. And then they clamp back. But this sort of stop back, go stop uh, sort of process is taking place within the realm of a gradual liberalization. So China is, in that sense, becoming more like a Western country. Right or wrong? Um, So uh, absolutely right that there is steady liberalization going on. And, um, you know, over time, uh, uh, that will make some degree of convergence in in policies and so on. Uh, At the same time, I think the methods that they use in these go phases, are largely spraying around easy credit. Um, Similarly, in these go phases, the households, because uh, they have inadequate savings, search for yield in in a lot of wrong places. So the kind of resource allocation that happens in these go phases is not not great. And the key concern is, as you liberalize you're also building up fragilities, especially corporate debt, uh, debt on state-owned corporations, as well as poor assets held by households. Um, which moves faster? Do you reach that end point of greater liberalization before the fragilities increase to the point that they create a significant setback? But the problems you described there are in a bit similar to what happened here before the financial crisis in 2007, because rise of debt then created... 
let's call it suboptimal resource allocation with all the problems in households as well. So in that sense, also it seems that, and if you look at China today, it's not only the, the assets, poor assets of banks, which is a problem, but also liabilities. Lang- banks are starting to lend more to each other. Right. So also in that sense, China right. looks, in a sense, more like the U.S. in 2006. Right. Uh, and so the question you have to ask is, does China have a better system to deal with the problem when it eventually emerges than the U.S. had? Or is it going to be a more difficult process of dealing with the problem? Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things you have to put into play when you talk about that uh, is then uh, how much confidence do people have in the government and how stable will the government be if, in fact, there's a serious financial crisis, right? Uh, uh, I think that's a question that I don't think is easy to answer. Uh, but it's a question which is central because the government stands behind the banks, uh, the state-owned banks. And if there's concern about the stability of the government, uh, there could be a much wider uh, process of, uh, a much more painful process of resolution than if, uh, if there wasn't. Now, the U.S. had a stable political system even while it was undergoing its economic crisis. And even then... Uh, Uh, with some of the best resolution systems in the world, uh, there was a fair amount of pain. Uh, With a relatively untried resolution system, the resolution system in in China has has not been tested, uh, but also with a political system which is uh, perhaps perhaps, uh, in the process of change, uh, there might be more concerns there. Okay, let's move over, to go back to the sort of long-term growth problems or challenges in the West. Uh, you never, I think you never really mentioned the term that Larry Summers coined, secular stagnation. Uh, in his analysis, this is mainly about the demand side. Robert Gordon and others have stressed the supply side. You actually hinted at both. Yeah. Would you say, would, would you agree to that there is such a thing as secular stagnation? And if so, for how long might it last? Well, uh, if, if by that, term, you mean uh, a slowdown in potential growth for a variety of reasons? Absolutely. I do think there is that. Um, I, I would say that, uh, I mean, if you take those two big culprits that are referred to, one, aging, you can't do anything about aging. That's sort of locked in stone. Uh, but uh, productivity may, in fact, come back much more strongly. Uh, that's something we have to wait and hope for. Uh, so I... Uh, uh, On the demand side, supply side, I mean, it's very hard to tell the two apart uh, because, uh, you know, absence of demand or uncertainty about demand may, in fact, create the reluctance to invest, which then creates lower uh, labor productivity growth, for example. Uh, So uh, I I think that uh, uh, those, uh, you know, in general, I, I, I do believe we are in a fairly slow growth phase. Uh, I think some of the danger comes from assuming that uh, all it takes to restore growth is to pump the economy up Mm -hmm. because that's when we get into excesses which create problems. I think that's what happened before the financial crisis uh, and I think it's important not to repeat that post-financial crisis. One of the reasons or hypotheses put forth by I think both Gordon and Summers actually is that real investments are lower than historically was common at this sort of, at, at least at this profit level. And one reason might be that in a situation with very low rates, uh, real rates and nominal rates, maybe the, the, the sort of hunt for yield is too, too high for companies. It's more difficult to, 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 to invest if you ask for a 15% yield with a zero inflation. Is that something you would agree to? Uh. Yeah, I, I think we don't fully understand the investment process. Uh, I, I, I think we, we're we still trying to understand why at these really low rates companies don't invest. And uh, there are enough sort of uh, candidates, uh, one of which, you know, the, uh, the one that's gaining popularity is this uncertainty uh, hypothesis that Bloom and Davis and others are talking about. Uh, but I think these are all different ways of saying that we have very low corporate investment uh, and we don't fully understand why corporates aren't more willing to invest. I, I think there are various elements. Uh, certainly low demand will, will play into this, but also uncertainty about uh, uh, policy. Uh, you know, With Brexit, for example, if I locate a factory here, 
I'm talking about 30 years. Uh, are, are, is the world going to remain open? So, uh, One last question, and then I'll throw it open to the floor. Uh, if this is a situation, how effective is it when central banks cut key rates to a very low level or even negative? Does that influence investments at all, in your view? Well, uh, my view has been no, uh, uh, but uh, I'm sure there's enough room for disagreement uh, in this in this room. Uh, I I do believe uh, that uh, you know whether one disagrees or agrees about that, no one uh, would probably be in favor of a rapid rise in interest rates given where we are, unless forced by a rapid rise in inflation. Nobody is advocating a rapid normalization because uh, any change will create problems for the system. Uh, That said, I do think a period of uh, very accommodative policy, uh, a period of uh, substantial liquidity uh, being infused into the system by central banks and an implicit central bank put uh, all create... Uh, problems of financial fragility that we see only when the normalization happens. Uh, in the U.S., for example, we're already seeing defaults on pension funds. Uh, you may have read about the city of Dallas, which uh, has just uh, found out that it has no money to service the pensions for its, uh, for its police officers and teachers. But I think you will see a lot more of that uh, uh, perhaps uh, as rates normalize, and that's, that's a source of worry. Uh, we open the floor for questions. The first one is right over here. Please wait until you get a microphone and then be kind enough to introduce yourselves to the camera and the audience. Me? No. Hey? Thomas Foffer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thomas Francin. I've been uh, thinking about these uh, problems for several years because... You might say, if you don't know, he was the deputy governor of the central bank and governor of the Swedish debt office for many years. And I wrote an article in the uh, Riksbank's review recently about it. Uh, The service uh, made by uh, the central bank shows really that there is a tendency for uh, financial targets in the companies to increase when the when there is a decrease in the interest rates, because it's easier than to achieve the financial targets. And uh, uh, then I think that the problem is really that we in the elite talk too little about the investment decisions and the capital market. Yeah? And I, I think that a main problem is really that the central banks and the if fiscal policy is trying to kickstart an economy with an extreme and sticky high uh, targets for return on equity. And the, the solution is probably not just to increase <laughs> the interest rates. On the other hand, we must discuss uh, what to do with the capital market and the investment uh, decisions. And now we, we find that, for instance, pension funds in, in Sweden, they complain about the low interest rates they have uh, in the interest rate market. But at the same time, they own a lot of companies which have financial targets aiming at a return on their equity of 15 to 20 percent. Thank you. You can hand, throw it backwards to the last row, please, and yeah, I, uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if what you're referring to is sort of a, a, a friction or a constraint in the market that the return on equity doesn't adjust to lower long real rates, uh, and, and as a result, you're held to too high uh, a required rate of return and why that might, might happen. Uh, that may be uh, uh, an issue of stickiness, which uh, which we need to explore more. Um, but uh, 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 first, I, I I wasn't advocating raising interest rates as a as a way to grow. I, I was saying more that there will be uh, potential volatility when you raise interest rates. But what you have to worry about is uh, volatility today versus volatility tomorrow. 
how much volatility will you have if you continue with this process significantly longer and then raise rates at a point when fragilities have become even greater than today. That's, that's all I was... I was uh, but on this point about high hurdle rates, um, uh, I haven't seen studies suggesting those rates are too high, but it, it's something worth investigating. Okay, I'd love to see that. Uh, my name is Inger Jäger, who I'm a journalist. Uh, you talked a lot about China and the United States, but you didn't mention very much about Europe or the euro area. Uh, was that because it uh, doesn't matter so much in a global context, or was it because it was too difficult? I recall an interview with Thomas Friedman once where he always talked about the U.S. and China until the reporter asked him exactly, why don't you mention Europe? And then he was quiet for a while and said, well, sure, the, the world needs a nice museum. <laughs> no, I, 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 I have no such views. I think Europe is, uh, is, is important. Uh, but I think Europe is, uh, is less in this race uh, uh, for... Um, um, sort of the post point uh, on uh, on post position on uh, on uh, on the global sort of uh, power structure. Uh, it's uh, certainly more inwardly focused today on dealing with some of the internal problems in the European Union. Uh, but I, I even if that wasn't the issue, it's less clear to me that it would be competing with the U.S. or with China and saying we are the biggest global power. Uh, I think uh, certainly uh, uh, the willingness to back economic power with military power uh, is probably uh, more uh, sort, of, uh, um, sort of centered on those two countries uh, than uh, today on Europe. Uh, but economically speaking, Europe is a huge part of the global economy and uh, what happens in Europe obviously matters tremendously for the rest of the world. Uh, Morten Blitz, Research Institute of Industrial Economics. First, thanks for an excellent presentation. I wanted to come back to the point about jobs moving from manufacturing to construction that you discussed. Uh, I mean, automation is also making inroads in many other areas, especially in the service sector. And this is a new part of the, of the ongoing structural change. We're, I mean, I just read recently Amazon is uh, going to try uh, a warehouse where you check out the food without actually meeting a cashier. So we're seeing sort of next level automation in, in, in lots of areas. Uh, the trucking industry, we're seeing self-driving trucks in Nevada, uh, taxis, etc. So there's a lot of other jobs that were previously not threatened by automation, which in the next 10 or 20 years are, are, are at risk. So what's your view on how the, this new process of switching jobs between sectors, how will that be perhaps different than, than in previous sectors? And are you worried more than, right. than you indicated? So, uh, uh, I think the, uh, uh, this was what I was referring to when I said the problems are going to get worse, that automation is proceeding apace and dealing with areas that have high employment of moderately skilled people. Trucking, as you mentioned, three and a half million trucking jobs in the United States. If you have driverless trucks, which probably is a reality in five years, uh, it's going to create major problems there. But it's not just trucks. It's all buses, taxis. Uh, Uber wants driverless taxis. Uh, already experiments being run there. So many of these jobs are going to be at, at stake. Uh, retail jobs you pointed to, yes, with uh, even forget the automated uh, shop uh, with online uh, purchases increasing now, 15, 20% of sales is through online, but steadily increasing. Uh, uh, that's going to require far fewer shopping assistants. Now, that said, we, we tend to have a, a sort of fixed pie view of the world that uh, if uh, more automation takes place, there are fewer jobs in the fixed pie. But if you have a growing pie view of the world, if in fact automation improves productivity, it is going to make goods cheaper, therefore people will want more of those goods, and therefore it will create whatever marginal jobs there are, it will create more of them. Uh, and if you look at history, that's invariably what has happened after a transition period. 
So the key is in the transition period, as we are learning how to use workers once again in new ways, and we're training them up for those new methods, uh, that we don't go back on what we already have. My worry is really about uh, making sure that the improvements uh, do happen without destroying the system. Uh, I think uh, uh, that, that, that's really uh, the source for concern. About whether there will be jobs going forward, I have no doubt that we'll figure out ways. But it also means that we may have to make societal changes in order to deal with some of these things. There may be new kinds of jobs we have to create. Uh, in order to deal with some of the automation that's happening. That's certainly something we need to start thinking about. What is, what is in, interesting, however, and this, this I want to emphasize, despite this level of automation you know, already within our horizon, uh, the kind of dramatic changes we need in reskilling workers simply is not appearing in some of the countries that we're talking about. Uh, we, that needs to be happening now. Yeah, one question. There is, um, there are some people claiming though that it's not really that you can't really infer from what happened in history to make the same conclusion now because previously, machines was was a substitution for muscles. Now it's a substitution for brain, and that might be qualitatively different. So, um, uh, yes, and 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 no. So, uh, uh, one of my. Uh, person who sits in an office for, 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 for those away from me is a guy from Harvard called Sendil Mulanathan, who um, is sort of a behavioral economist, but now is, is retooling himself on machine learning. And one of the things he emphasizes is, yes, machines can do what humans can do in some tasks much better than the humans. But machine plus human can do better than machine or human individually. So what we will have to find out is how we combine machine and human in many places. Of course, we know situations where even something as, as fantastic as Watson gives a completely silly answer, which a high school uh, graduate would know is, is, is wrong. And that's, that's what I mean, that uh, uh, the machine works on patterns, uh, the human has a different way of thinking. When you put those two together, you sometimes get much better solutions. In fact, you often get much better solutions. So what we'll have to do is think, rethink jobs. And that's why it seems to me there will be a period of transition as we rethink what humans can do. Uh, and invariably we'll find, see, after all, we are, we're making stuff for humans. Ultimately, who's consuming the stuff? It's humans. And humans have a different set of needs from what the machines can produce. And that, to my mind, will mean that we all always need humans in the production process. I'm looking forward to the day when you will have fully automated moderators. That <laughs> can be placed. And, speakers, and speakers. And speakers. That might go even faster. <laughs> <laughs> we have about 10 people on the list, so be, you will be there eventually. But over okay. there, yes, please. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Matthias Sundling. I work at uh, Danske Bank as an equity strategist. Uh, just, I have a million questions, but I've narrowed it down to two. Uh, just in hindsight, was it too big a supply shock with China's entering into the WTO? Should and what's the what's the policy lesson that uh, should we be more careful, being prepared next time we expand? Uh, I don't know world trade or whatever uh, is next in line. And second that's, of all, that's one question. Yeah, that's my question. And second of all, Japan and G uh, debt to GDP. What do you see happening there? Because that's the, the Japan sort of leading the way in, in this whole debt cycle and the demographically as well. So where do you see that uh, playing uh, out? Thank you. So on, uh, on the first, was it too fast? Well, you know, you have to do a full welfare analysis, right? Yes, we have political tensions. Yes, uh, one could perhaps even link some of the tensions in the Euro, uh, um, Euro uh, zone or the or European Union. Uh, to some of the inflows of imports from from China, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, thirty dollar DVD machines thir or thirty euro DVD machines have made l lives of many people much easier. Um, audio equipment, at least at the lower end, is now extremely cheap. Uh, so, what's the full welfare analysis? A and I would argue uh, that invariably, despite Despite the disruption, 
and the dislocation, uh, it probably is beneficial. Now, that's, that's more a belief rather than based on data. Uh, that said, uh, I think too many economists are jumping off the trade is good uh, to a much more nuanced and, and um, uh, I think, uh, a view which is probably uh, reasonable, but which allows the opponents of trade to drive a truck through the trade uh, uh, issue. I think what we have to focus on is make it easier for those who lose from trade to to come up, uh, to survive. Uh, instead, uh, so much of the talk now has gone towards limiting trade. Uh, and I think that's uh, more problematic, if nothing else, because you are also barring the path for a significant part of humanity to come to similar levels of per capita income uh, as the rich world. And, and I think uh, uh, if you look for solutions to the problems of aging, to the problems of insufficient demand, almost surely the answer will lie in taking the emerging markets, taking the developing countries as partners, rather than as seeing them as part of the problem. Uh, hi, Tobin Becker, ex-IMF, of course, and then site at the Stockholm School of Economics nowadays. I wanted to follow up. You said uh, there are some similarities between the 30s and now, uh, but then you also sort of demissed that parallel a little bit. But I wanted to ask a little bit about protectionism. You have mentioned it sort of in passing a, a couple of times, but, I mean, if Trump really takes seriously uh, those increases in tariffs and other countries start to respond to that, today in the FT we also had uh, the minister in, in, in France discussing that we will not be protectionist, but we will take measures to respond to anything that would harm us. So what are actually the, the uh, realistic or relevant policy responses that we can have if Trump or other countries engage in, in that kind of protectionism? And, and what are actually the global institutions that we can believe helps us resolve these issues? I mean, the WTO seemed to be pretty weak. The IMF would have to act if you have balance of payments crisis. But, I mean, where would you put your faith? And, and what are actually the, the good policy responses? So uh, this, is, this is a very good question, and I think the central question we face today. Uh, much of the uh, post-World War II global trading and investment environment was driven by the United States, uh, was driven by a confident United States with, in partnership with Europe. I think these were the two forces that lie behind the structures. Uh, and as these forces now turn inwards, uh, the question is, who is going to support? Uh, gaps, spaces are opening up. Now, we've already seen that, uh, you know, for example, on climate change, we saw China stepping up a little bit and saying, this is something that we believe in, that, that we need action from all, and we'll, we, we'll, we'll commit to doing our part. It may be that uh, one answer is some of the emerging markets step up more. Uh, but I do think that given the institutions uh, were created and are, in some sense, looking up to the, uh, uh, to the Western uh, powers, that overnight uh, 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 a retreat into isolationism by them may create a vacuum in international policy, uh, which, which the emerging markets may take time to step up and, and certainly will not fully fill. Uh, so uh, it, is a, it is a potential source of tension. Uh, I think the uh, multilateral institutions should continue the process of reform so that they're more balanced and so that they're uh, based on a broader set of shoulders and not overly dependent on, on, on the Western powers, especially at this time of uh, more inward-looking uh, focus in those countries. It's Harald Magnus Andreasen from Swedbank in Oslo. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, just a couple of qu questions, comments. Uh, if you look at the rich part of the world, it's running uh, in balance in, in trade with the rest of the world. So manufacturing jobs ha have not been lost due to globalization. We have differences in different countries. Uh, and w what's the reflection? Why are some countries like US, like UK, 
running huge deficit on the current account trend balance, when other countries like, well, Sweden, UK, excuse me, Germany and Norway, or well, Norway is that soil, but the, your other guys are running surpluses. So it might be more to do with distribution between countries rather than a scapegoat called China. The second thing is that I, f I find it a bit difficult to find explanation for populism through developments of the labor market, except for income distribution. I mean, we have the highest employment rates ever in UK. We have the 10 years lowest unemployment almost in, in US, 20 years time in, in uh, Japan, 35 years low in, in, in Germany. So labor markets, if you look at them from a macro view, they are not bad at all. There has not been a demand problem. Unemployment has fallen all over the rich world, and it's no lower than normal. And in four biggest countries, it's the lowest in decades. So my suspicion is that there is something about inequality, but most likely also substantial contributions from other factors that we as economists are trying to take care of that part of society cannot do so much about. It's about immigration, no doubt. I'm quite confident without a refugee crisis in Europe last year, we wouldn't have Brexit. It's about other cultural changes as well, and you mentioned some of them, that are really hard to cope with, I guess, with economic measures. So then we're back to what we can do, and I think that we'll come back to income distribution, which is hard to really tackle in those countries where we don't have institutions that are able to do that. In Sweden you have, in Norway we have, and we don't have the same populist problem either. Right. Um, so uh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, I'd, I'd say, uh, uh, you know, broadly agree with the tenor of the question that in the midst of plenty, why are we so anxious? And you have to be anxious only if there's a distributional issue. Uh, because I do think that uh, slower growth is part of the problem because if it was much faster, the distribution issue would also be much less than we, uh, uh, you know, there would be plenty of jobs in new areas and, and some of these people could fill uh, them. But, but you're absolutely right that the people who are being hurt are people who haven't the means or the uh, ability to reposition themselves for the jobs that are being created and they see others who perhaps were forced to reposition themselves earlier, uh, women, um, um, you know, some minorities, uh, now going ahead because they didn't get the uh, safe jobs in manufacturing earlier, therefore went into services, went into other stuff, and now those are the jobs that are, are moving ahead while these jobs are, are, are shrinking. Uh, they were the guys who went out and got an education uh, because they couldn't get a job. Uh, after leaving high school and so on. There may be a little bit of that also playing out. But I agree that it is a fall from grace to some extent that is a bigger source of anxiety. We were the dominant group, and now look at where we are. Uh, as opposed to an absolute poverty, uh, it's the relative poverty which is much more a concern uh, for these groups. And that is why I think uh, some of the measures that you have followed in Sweden uh, on support for retraining, support for reskilling. I had a very nice conversation with a number of your experts yesterday on these issues. I think that's, that's extremely important. We need to figure out how to emulate. Uh, but it's also very expensive. And so we also need to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, but I think uh, you're absolutely right. It would be even more expensive if we let the system break down because we don't deal with this problem. So uh, I had a Per Stromberg, Stockholm School of Economics. I had a um, somewhat related question. I mean, it seems when you talk about the productivity puzzle, why you know we don't see more productivity? It seems just inevitable that you know we, with new technology, we will produce you know way more goods and services with uh, capital and labor and raw materials. I mean, it just seems inevitable, right? So. Um, so the problem will be redistribution, right? Because the winners of this, this, isn't this kind of inevitable? You think so? I'm thinking like the U.S. You don't hear that. I mean, that's one of the things Trump can go to say that you know we're going to lower taxes for the rich, which doesn't seem like redistribution in the U.S. I feel that the people redistribution in the U.S. is very much associated with giving to super poor people, and the people are now hurt. They don't feel they feel that they're paying. Right. Or, you know, but right. they would actually at some point would have to be the 
recipients of redistribution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so isn't this kind of inevitable? And then the second thing, which is also a type of redistribution, I mentioned the raising debt levels everywhere, you know, in first one country, then the other country. It seems like everyone is indebted, okay? So there needs to be a debtor and there needs to be a creditor. You know, as a lowly corporate finance person, it's easy to deal with over leverage. Everyone just writes down their debt. Yeah. Um, but, you know, who are the creditors, I guess, who will lose out from the delevering? Well, uh, okay, so let me start with the second second point. I mean, uh, take a country like Japan, right? The 230 or 240% debt to GDP, a lot of it is owed internally uh, to Japanese households. So eventually... Uh, you know, they are the guys who will have to figure out whether they get paid or not. Uh, but I think that it's a little more complicated uh, because in addition to the debt, there are also long-term entitlements uh, as well as current services. So when a government is deciding how do I manage this, question is do I raise taxes? Uh, do I cut down on services? Do I default on my debt? do I uh, default on entitlements? That is a very messy combination. And there are different levels of protection. I mean, you see it, as, as you know, already with states. Um, uh, different states have different levels of protection. Uh, in, in Illinois, I think you cannot default on pension obligations, but you cannot also default on debt. Debt first gets paid. So, so constitutionally, it's in a bind. It has to figure out how to deal with uh, uh, some of these massive obligations. Uh, taxation levels, uh, certainly, you know, seeing property taxes, they've been rising pretty fast in uh, in Illinois. So uh, something has to give, uh, and that's that's what's very unclear. But but you're right that at some point you have to write down uh, excessive obligations, and somebody will take a hit. On the Isn't Japan, quite obvious. If I use your evident word, I mean, you have the government which is indebted, and then you have the main creditor, which is the postal office or the postal bank, which is government-owned. So there will be a huge write-down eventually. Right. Uh, but eventually, um, you know, uh, there are write-downs there. The central bank owns a whole lot. So when you net all that off, there still is a net outside obligation, which is owned by the households. No, uh, uh, which is owned by the households. And remember, some of these ob uh, government debt is also hold, held as sort of part of the social security returns that will uh, that will happen. And so if you default on that, then you've defaulted on the social security. Uh, I mean, these are complicated structures, uh, and you have to look through all of them to see what the net obligation is. Uh, but you're, uh, you're right that there is some netting that has to be done. Uh, you can't look at gross uh, um, debt. On the uh, earlier issue of redistribution, it is actually, uh, I think, going to get more, more complicated. First, I don't think you can just write a check to, to a vast number of people. People don't like to receive a check in the mail and say, you stay at home, sit on your couch and watch TV, uh, but we'll give you a check. I mean, that's, uh, we've seen that happen with, for example, these uh, Native American reservations, and that creates a whole set of new problems, right? So people want the ability uh, to work. question is, what kinds of work can they have if they're unwilling or incapable of uh, moving to the new sectors. Uh, that's something society has to deal with. Can we create new jobs which are meaningful uh, for these kinds of people? Jobs in managing the community, jobs in you know, uh, giving mentorship to youth. Uh, how big a government does that create? Uh, what is the tolerance level for all that? But I think there has to be some rethinking on that process, and that addresses perhaps some of those people who think we're being a little too optimistic about dealing with the problems of technology. Yes, we may have to rethink society also. Another place we may have to rethink society is on property rights. If, in fact, we have winner-take-all aspects to property rights, you know, this patent uh, gives somebody $100 billion, but uh, uh, somebody who doesn't have that is basically toast, uh, and 25 employees uh, get to share that 100 billion. Uh, do we have to rethink property rights and how much? Uh, those are all issues we will we'll have to confront. Uh, time is running out. I will unfortunately have, I can only let in two more questions. That will be Marianne and Mia, and then we're done. Sorry. Marianne. Uh, I am Radetsky, 
Uh, at about the time of your birth, Raghuram, I spent a four-year period in India. Since then, I have become a student of economics, and in my studies, I am puzzled by the historically exceptional low interest rates that we see throughout the world today. And when I ask my colleague economists, they say to me, but the answer to this historical exceptionality is very simple. Uh, savings are greater than spending on consumption and investment. And here I come to a problem with your presentation. Because your presentation stated that for the United States there were really two issues that were of importance. One was demography, but then you said demography involves lesser, lesser spending, more savings before retirement, but then after retirement people spend much more. Now, I believe that most of the baby boom generation is now in the process of being retired, so there should be that demand. And then, even more, you emphasized very strongly that both the United States and China suffer from excessive indebtedness. How can that be reconciled with the low interest rates? Because it is not a question of spending too, too little on, in, uh, on uh, consumption and investment when indebtedness grows. Marianne, you use your microphone like a pom-pom girl uses her baton. You should speak into it. Uh, so let me try and uh, parse that. First, uh, the baby boomer generation has started retiring gre greater uh, quantities, but it's a long period, right? Remember, we, uh, the baby boomer generation is, what, 40, 47, 48 to 1964. So the, uh, I'm probably one of the last of the baby boomers, uh, of course, born in India. But uh, uh, the uh, point is, people like me are thinking about retirement and are saving more given that that retirement is impending. So it's the net effect you have to think about. The ones who have already retired and who are probably spending more versus the ones who are going to retire and now saving more. And I think the general sense is that uh, that net effect uh, for now is subtracting from demand rather than adding, uh, adding to demand. Now, uh, on the uh, uh, second issue of indebtedness, yes, uh, demand was pumped up in the period where the indebtedness was increasing. Uh, but once... Uh, you know, uh, there comes a period of reckoning and you're delevering and so on, you have the opposite effect. And I think what we're seeing in, in a number of situations is either the leverage has gotten too much, you cannot uh, fund that consumption anymore because you are over-indebted. That's uh, Amr Sufi and uh, Atif Mian's point that the households who went out on a spending spree are no longer in the action today because they have too much debt. Uh, but it could also be that those who are heavily indebted are now using the incremental money that they get uh, uh, in income and so on to pay down the debt rather than in spending more, the deleveraging that people talk about. So you're right. In the process of increasing debt, yes, there's more demand. But, but certainly in the United States, we are in a process of deleveraging, which is now stabilizing. Uh, in China, uh, I think we're still uh, trying to figure out where we are. And the final word goes to our host, Mia. Yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned or kind of complained that uh, fellow economists are giving up on trade uh, or are giving more um, attention to the negative aspects of trade. Uh, could I ask you, is that because uh, the argument is that there are questions about the net benefits uh, on the aggregate level of, of, of uh, open borders in terms of trade? Or that it's too difficult to find policy measures and implement policy measures to compensate the losers, those who are complaining? So um, there was a long period when emerging markets were being urged to open up their borders. And every time we were urged to open our borders, it was always trade is so beneficial. And we talked about how this affected you know, people differently, that certain industries were put out of action by opening up. 
And at that time, nobody paid attention to the negative effects of trade. Yes, you can always compensate them. On In general, it's positive and so on. And over time, we realized, yes, in general, it's positive, it's beneficial. Yes, there are people who lose out. There are industries that shut down. But over time, we build on those industries and new industries get created. We learn to deal with the adverse effects of trade. Uh, essentially, we, we sucked it up and, and worked. Uh, we don't have great methods. And... and uh, what we need to figure out is better methods to deal with those who lose out from trade. But that said, uh, it seems to me the tolerance level for pain uh, should be proportionately similar in industrial countries. You cannot turn around at the first sign of pain and say, you know, we told you guys to open up and we benefited from that in exporting to you. Now you're exporting back to us and you're causing us some pain. Wait, 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 trade is not good. Stop exporting to us. That seems to me an unequal equation. Uh, it's better that you say, yes, trade is generally good, but we need to figure out how to compensate those who are losing out. And yes, these people who are losing out are probably starting at a much higher level of income than the guys who lost out in your situation. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? They have more income, but it's a bigger fall. So we need to figure out what to do. And that means retraining, spending resources, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I don't think the immediate answer is, yes, there's so much pain, so this opens up the, the door for all those who say, let's stop trade. Uh, and I think longer run, uh, stopping trade is going to be extremely damaging for the whole world. And, uh, and therefore, uh, we economists should certainly recognize the costs, but not turn our backs and say we were wrong all, of, all the time. So, Raghuram, um, these have been a fascinating 90 minutes. What I personally like so much about your presentation and the su subsequent discussion is that you are not only a great theorist, you have also seen practical economic policy close up at the IMF and the RBI. And you sort of weave together a picture and analysis which is both political in a broad sense and economic. So you live up to the sort of the... The, the name of our discipline, which was there from the beginning, political economy, and I like that so much. So thank you very much. Thank for you. Coming.